Let me pray with you. Let's get into this word. Lord Jesus, speak through your word that we are closer to you when this moment is over than we were when it first began. We give you glory and praise. We honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated as you give the Lord a great praise. Let's get in the word. How many people are ready for the word? Let's get this done. Let's get you guys home by about 1245 or so. <laughs> y'all laughing because y'all know me. <laughs> like, we'll be at there about 243. <laughs> no, we won't. I'm going to honor your time. Ephesians chapter 3, starting at the 14th verse, reading from the New King James Version. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. Somebody say inner man. Amen. That Christ may dwell in you, dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. The inner man. The inner man. This is not an external work. This is something that God wants to invest in you, instill in you, and seed in you. The enemy wants to hold you hostage to the lowest version of yourself, the worst version of yourself. He wants you to assume that God is so angry at you that he could never use you, utilize you, restore, refurbish, and relaunch you. The devil is a liar. I'm so glad that God does not base his love or commitment or investment to us based on external things. I'm grateful that God specializes in the title of my message, which is quite simply the inside job. Tell somebody it's an inside job. Anybody ever watched a movie where there was a robbery and the cops come in? And they were like, this was too perfect. No way they knew where the alarms were. They knew where the cameras were. They knew how to get in and out without us catching them. Somebody had to know something. It must have been. I want you to know that God specializes in inside jobs. If you'll travel with me through the word for just a moment, you will hear where my heart is because for the last six weeks we've been talking about vision who we are as a church what we believe and as pastor it's important for me to declare vision so you know what it is we stand for so you will know whether or not you want to stand with us I believe you should know what your leaders stand for what they believe don't just come to church because you like the music or you like the building go where you're being led go where you're being fed go where they preach Jesus as for me and this house and relentless 13 weeks old we are committed to being a multicultural multi-generational unapologetically Jesus preaching Holy Spirit led and filled church and we will build teams that reflect the kingdom and we will be intentionally diverse, whether that's uncomfortable to you or not. If you don't like white people and you black, too bad for you. If you white and don't like black people, too bad for you. If you Mexican and you don't like black people, that's crazy because we cousins. And so you need to understand that we are family in here. So you leave your racist or prejudiced self and all of that foolishness out there when you come in here because the only color that matters in here is red and it's the blood of Jesus. Can I get an amen? I said, can I get an amen? A to the man, to the man, man, man. I'm trying to preach, Pastor Kenny. We have been given a mandate 
to shift culture. For too long, the church has been following behind culture. Culture needs to catch up to us. We don't go to their movies. They come to our movies. Y'all missed that. We just did our own movie two weeks ago. Some of y'all were like, well, it wasn't a blockbuster. It was for us because we busted up the block and let the devil know we up in here. Can I get an amen in here, Pastor Jermaine? I need somebody to understand we didn't have $30 million. We had a whole bunch of volunteers, some Jesus, and some Krispy Kreme donuts. And we turned that around and did a movie in a week. Don't tell me what God won't do. Don't tell me you serve the creative God of the universe and you can't come up with one idea. What does it mean to be a follower of Christ? There are many people who attend many churches all over the world, but there are very few disciples. And you can tell the difference, Sophia, between a disciple and a regular church attendee because regular church attenders do it out of religiosity. They do it because it's habit. It's habitual. And right around the fall, they get the itch because at 1 o'clock on Sundays, their team comes on TV. So they hope the service doesn't run long. It doesn't matter if the Holy Ghost is healing people from, from quadriplegic issues or healing cancer as long as he does it by 1245. We put the miracle of God on a time limit because we are culturally conditioned for Jesus to be on our schedule. That is casual church attendance. But disciples... Wherever he is, there, there they are. And as soon as Jesus opens his mouth, they're right there. They got, they got vision journals and big real Bibles, not on their phone, but the real Bible the, with the pictures in it and the, and the bookmark in it, the heavy one, the 13-pound Bible. It's like a baby. You strap it into the car seat, and they just in there with the Bible, and they got four highlighters, and they always smiling, and it makes carnal people insecure, and they don't, they don't like them kind of Christians. You always smiling. Why you act like everything's all right? I know your life. I know everything's not fine. You're right. Everything is not fine. In fact, it's terrible, but that's why I'm smiling because my joy is not contingent upon my circumstances stance because I know who he is and even though all hell is breaking loose apparently it's working for my good because that's what his word says are there any crazy believers in here that will worship God in spite of circumstance are there any worshipers in here that love God whether he gives you everything you want or not are there any believers in here that are truly wanting to be disciples of Christ Tell somebody it's an inside job. The challenge of an inside job is that the inside job is inside of us. And because the Holy Spirit does not possess, you cannot get in unless you allow it. This is very important from a theological construct because there are people who will say things like, I don't know what happened, the Holy Spirit took over. And I was shouting and I hit somebody in the face. That was the Holy Ghost. <laughs> no, the Holy Ghost is not going to make you punch your neighbor in the face. The Holy Spirit doesn't possess you to worship himself. I know that I'm worshiping. I choose to worship. I'm aware of my surroundings when I worship. The Holy Spirit doesn't possess you. You're not out of your mind. You are having his mind. So you are supernaturally aware of your surroundings. Demons possess. And demons cannot possess a believer. Let's go on and get that straight right now. Now they can, they can oppress. They can push on you. They can mess with you. But they cannot get inside. They cannot possess you. You can't be filled with the Holy Ghost and devil's just sitting in there. So some of y'all are like, well, how come I keep sinning? That's flesh. I'm trying to help somebody, Pastor DeMarcus. Well, that don't make sense. It's got to be the devil because, because I, I'm doing wrong. So the devil is in here. No, it's called flesh and flesh has to be regenerated over time. That's the difference between salvation and sanctification. 
Salvation is my concession. Sanctification is my journey. See, when you walk with him, things begin to change in your life. Oh, I know y'all don't know old hymns because we sing all this new stuff, but there's an old song. My mother taught it to me years ago. And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. It's an inside job. There's a difference between external church appearance and tactical, strategic, direct, intensive discipleship. In, under, in order to understand what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, you need to understand the culture and context that Jesus was walking with his disciples. This word discipleship and what it meant and how it was expressed is very different from the way we do church in Western Christian thought. We come to church for an hour, an hour and 20 minutes. If it's me preaching, it's an hour and 45 minutes, maybe a little longer, pray for me. Actually, don't. We need more, Jesus, not less. But the New Testament theologian, David Flusser, wrote before he passed, teaching in his class, he, this is a paraphrase, he was brilliant. He could read, he knew the Old Testament by heart, and he was not a believer. But he says, how dare, how dare we say, or people say, they called themselves disciples of the rabbi, Yeshua ben Yosef, who we call Jesus the Christ, but we are not at his feet at all four of the gospels each day of the week. I hope that convicted some folk. Because if you're wondering why your life is not producing fruit, perhaps you can check what you've been sowing. How are you a disciple but you, you don't study the word every day? The word disciple in this construct, in the Jewish culture, the disciples of a rabbi would literally follow the rabbi wherever the rabbi would go. They literally, this is true, and Pastor Darius helped me with this, they would literally sit outside of the bathroom waiting for their rabbi to come out because the rabbi, after relieving himself, would say a prayer, a prayer to God. And I'm telling you, they would literally, he would say, blessed are you, O God, king of the universe, for giving us openings in our bodies. The rabbi would say that, and they wouldn't leave because they wanted a blessing. Now, if, if they are following their teacher to the bathroom, but we're looking at our clock, There's a difference between what we're doing and what he was asking. See, because Jesus made it clear, I want everything. Rich young ruler, hey, I'm doing all of the, the law stuff, behavior, external. Jesus was like, sell all you have, give it to the poor, and then come follow me. He was like, mm, I'm good. And what Jesus was saying is, I'm going to go after the thing you've been holding on to. And I don't know what your thing is, but that, whatever you're thinking, right there, he wants that. Don't be trying to hide it in the back of your mind. Bring it back up. Come on, come on, bring it to the altar. Come on, Cletus, come on, come on, come on. Everybody has something they want to hold on to. Jesus says, I'll take that. That's the distance between your casual church attendance and real discipleship. I can always tell the difference between casual Christianity and true discipleship because casual Christians will leave this moment and just have regular conversations. After we were witnesses to miracles, they don't even want to talk about that. They talk about stuff that don't matter, the latest movie or what's on sports. And it's funny because if you truly believe that you were in the presence of God, wouldn't you tell everybody you know? Let me tell you how real belief is. Watch this. Are there any Clemson Tiger fans in this room? 
If you really believe Clemson is the best team, stand up. Make some noise for your team. Rep your team. Lewis, come on. Come on, Lewis. This is, this is, this is the upstate. This is Gamecocks. Where's South Carolina Gamecocks at? We had Jadavian Clowney. Understand this. But then we got people from Georgia. Any Bulldogs fans in here? What about Alabama? Roll Tide? Any Crimson Tide? All two of y'all. You better sit down. This is... They will crash into your car after church. I'm like, oh, excuse me. How about pro teams? Any Dallas Cowboys fans in here? Any Carolina Panthers fans in here? Any Atlanta Falcons fans in here? Any Redskins fans? Washington is? <laughs> He just stood up looking like the professor of a college. Just... Yes, as a matter of fact, I am. I'm going to have a beverage. Even when your team loses, it messes with your emotions. You're less happy. You speak to less people. When your team wins, you hug strangers. It doesn't matter if they lost last week, if they win this week, you screaming, we're number one. It doesn't matter if I could give you statistical metrics to show they're not number one. It doesn't matter. It's because you believe. See, what I believe is not up for debate. I'm trying to help somebody. And we get passionate about what we believe in. So don't tell me you believe in Jesus, but nobody knows you're on the team. Don't tell me you believe in Jesus and you never rock the jersey. Don't tell me you believe in Jesus, but you don't hang out with any of the fans. You don't hang out at the church, no small groups, don't volunteer. You don't want to do nothing, don't want to give anything, but you call yourself a disciple. But I can't tell because there's no evidence in your life. Some of y'all shouted louder for your football team than you did for the God who saved you. And I'm going to give you a second to turn it around. We are not going to shout louder for a team that doesn't know us than the God who saved us. I need some crazy praisers to give Jesus a praise. Some of y'all in that balcony, you just sitting down. I'm going to wait for you to stand up. I love you, but some of y'all need to give God a praise. Don't sit on Jesus. He didn't sit on you. Matter of fact, he stood up for you. For three hours, he hung on a cross. The least you can do is praise him for a few seconds. Somebody give him a praise. If you know what he did for you. Jesus is more than a casual habit. He needs to be the passion of your life, Mama Teresa. What do you believe? And how does it manifest itself? What, it, what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus, for Jesus to take hold of the inner man? You see this image of a vault. What's inside the vault? Say it again. Be careful who you let in the vault. Can I get an amen from anyone who's ever had a broken? You open the door to the vault, they went in there and wreaked havoc because they didn't understand who you were, what you carry, or how to handle your... That's why so many of us have heart issues. Oh, and now you don't trust. Now you're cynical. Now you're always angry. You don't believe that you can love again, that you can forgive again. It's called heart disease. 
Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. And then some of us have made bad decisions and it's corrupted our heart. That's why David said in Psalm 51, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit in me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Then I'll teach transgressors your way. When you give me a new heart, I'll tell everybody that it was you that did it. People have been lied to by religious people. You a hypocrite because you go to church but you still sin. Well, that doesn't make me a hypocrite. It makes me human. If, if that makes me a hypocrite, for the two of y'all clapping, the rest of y'all scared because you're not sure if I'm giving you a license to sin. No, I'm not. I'm giving you context because bad theology has you thinking you have to behave. Oh, I'm about to break this devil in half. My relationship with God is not behavior-based. It's belief-based. Come on, John chapter 11. Jesus talking to Martha. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those that believe in me, if they were dead, yet shall they live. And those that live and believe in me will never die. Do you believe this? He didn't say, will you behave like this? You can believe before you behave. Watch this. And my behavior doesn't change my belief. Watch this. Any of us have kids in here? Have your kids ever done something wrong? You ever had to whoop your kids? Wait, I'm sorry, we're online. Have you ever had to give your children time out? I know it's a psychologist watching right now. Taking He advocates for spanking the children. Yes, I do. I got a couple whoopings in my life and I needed them. I turned out all right. I'm not saying abuse the kids. You know, we got some mixed couples in here, so only whoop your kids half the time. <laughs> half whooping, half time out. <laughs> my son, Pastor Avatar will be my witness. My son always likes to antagonize his little sister. Out of the blue, she's not bothering him. He'll just go pinch her. Boom. And I'll see it. What are you doing? It was an accident. <laughs> How you six and lying? Just snaggle tooth because his tooth is gone. It looked like I-85 is in his mouth. He just, excuse me, daddy. Excuse me, daddy. So I say, come here. Turn him around, give him a popping on them jeans. Don't you do it again. And I'm not playing. <laughs> yes, 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 sir. Yes, yes, sir. <laughs> Ten minutes later. <laughs> come here. I'm not going to whoop you. Just look at me. Look. <laughs> I'm not playing with you. Now I'm talking through my teeth. I'm not playing with you. You know when you talk through your teeth, you are not playing. You got to talk through your teeth at the store because people looking at you in Target. Just, just, you better be glad that white woman right there. I'll whoop, I'll whoop your behind. They put me in jail. I'll tear you up. Don't you do another. Don't touch a toy. You can't have no. Put the toy down. Put it down. You ain't not getting you nothing. You don't. Good to see you. Shut your mouth. Do one more thing. Ten minutes later. Was he my son the first time he did it? Yeah. Was he my son the last time he did it? Yeah. Did his relationship change with me based on his behavior? The reason why he could receive the correction is because he knew I was his dad. 
And if I was correcting him, it was because I loved him. And so his belief in me didn't change. Ah, even while his behavior wasn't lining up with my expectation. And as soon as he said he was sorry, I was his okay, son. Even though I know he's going to do it again, but I'm his father. So I'm always going to give him the benefit of the doubt. Now, devils want you to think because you keep struggling with the same thing that God wants to get rid of you. But the Bible says when we are faithless, he is faithful for he cannot deny himself. I need you to touch three people and tell them I'm still his child. I'm still his child. I'm trying to preach in here. You didn't high five three people. What do you believe? Some of y'all, this is just an extended nap for you to wake up once you leave. But for the rest of us, we are here every week. And we could be anywhere else. Some of y'all drove three, four hours. How many of y'all drove two hours? Three hours. And you drove more than four hours? You mean to tell me y'all can't do better than that for people drove more than four hours to come to church? You'll know you're a disciple based on what you're willing to pay to stay close to Jesus. Oh, help me, Jesus. See, belief and discipleship go hand in hand. Don't tell me you believe, but there's, there, you're not running after Jesus. See, the goal of this walk is Christ-likeness. What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus, to allow Jesus access to the inner man, the inner woman, the inside job, because this is not behavior-based. This is belief-based. And even though I may not behave, what I believe cannot change. But if I believe long enough, my behavior will change. Because my behavior is not planted, my belief is. And if if my belief is planted, it takes root. And then it has rooting system. And then whatever grows can handle the wind and the waves that come. And if it's rooted, then God can prune off the behaviors that don't look like Jesus. But I don't want to plant my behavior because then my beliefs are up for grabs. And I'm not going to allow anybody to tell me what I don't believe or what I do believe. I'm not here to force you to believe in my Jesus but you will not talk me down from my Jesus. I believe Jesus is the son of the living God. I believe he's the only way to the Father. I believe that these 66 books were God-breathed, Holy Spirit-inspired. I believe that they are investigatable and verifiable. And you yourself can find external methods of looking at scripture to see if it is what it says it is. But my belief is not up for grabs. Does anybody want to be a disciple? Careful. You see your hands. Some of y'all are like, I'm not sure how much it costs. <laughs> I'm glad you asked, Mallory. Say it again. How much it costs? Huh? Your whole American, your whole Canadian life, your whole, whatever you are, wherever you're from, wherever your whole life. Jesus says nothing less than everything. Is what it costs. And we got too many rena Christians. And we want out of our rental when issues rise up. When when Jesus asks for more, we're like, no, I don't want to pay that. And then we got too many rental Christians. They get offended by a preacher or offended by somebody in church and they leave. You're not rooted. That's why you can't grow. 65 years old, you've been in 15 churches and you offended. Devil, I bind you right now. I'm going to preach this word. Rent a Christians versus those who have purchased, took out a mortgage, said, I'm, I, I'm owning. I'm going to buy this. I'm going to own it 
Because to become like Jesus, we must sit at his feet the way the disciples sat at his feet. They were with Jesus constantly, they followed him closely, and they listened to him eagerly. They wanted to be like Jesus that much. How many people really want to be more like Jesus? Well, here's, here's, uh, here's something I want you to write down before we, we shift. How can a relationship blossom with no intimacy? If the only time you engage Jesus is in here, that's public displays of affection. But here's the thing about public displays of affection. There's only, there are limits to public displays of affection. When children are conceived, it is in a moment of private intimacy. And God wants to birth something out of the relationship which requires you to spend intimate time with him away from the masses. See, here's the thing. When you see a woman who's showing, you may not know the date of conception, but you know that intimacy occurred based on the evidence you see. We got a whole bunch of Christians talking about you about to birth something, but your stomach is spiritually flat. Here's the thing. If you've really been walking with Jesus, you don't have to tell anybody. It'll shh. I need some help, Pastor D. I said it will show. Tell somebody, are you showing? Tell somebody else, ask them, are you showing? You cannot do intimate things in public places, which means if the only time you worshiping, shouting, praising is for the 15, 20 minutes that they're up here, then I can tell you that your life is not producing discipleship level fruit because you are not sowing the appropriate time. You need to be in the gospels to know what Jesus thought, how he felt, how he walked, how he talked, who he loved. Nobody wants to shout. Everybody wants houses and land and a new car. Nobody wants to be a disciple because you can have all that stuff and still have no peace. I've heard it said that love is equivalent to time. Who you spend time with. That's how you know who you love. Don't tell God you love him. You give him four minutes in the shower, three minutes in the car. It's real quiet. How do you know you love him? when every time he wants to spend intimate time, you're interrupted by a text, a phone call, your favorite program, an alert that somebody liked your picture. He can't even spend time with you because you're too busy checking Facebook instead of having your face in his book. When you love somebody, you spend inordinate amounts of time and there's a passion that comes. When you love somebody, you start doing goofy things. Like, no, you hang up. No, you hang up. <laughs> you, you so silly, you so stupid, you're crazy. You're crazy, I wanna have your baby. No, you hang up. Anybody ever been in love like that? Butterflies, you see the phone ring, your heart start beating? That's how Pastor Av was when daddy used to call. Anybody ever, when you were falling in love, y'all go on your little dates to the expensive restaurant like Chili's or Olive Garden? <laughs> you give them the last breadstick? <laughs> I ain't giving up my sweet tea. You got this breadstick, but I'm gonna drink this sweet tea. Ain't no more, they ain't made no more. That's the last little bit. But don't tell me you, you love him, but you won't sneak away and have lunch with Jesus. You won't sneak away and have quiet time at the house. You won't turn the TV off to spend time. True discipleship is intimacy because he's trying to get in. The, the Bible says, behold, I stand at the door and 
knock. He wants access to your heart. And when he gets in there, he's not in there to hurt you. He's in there to heal you. See, when Jesus gets in, not only is he a carpenter, he's a surgeon. He knows how to get the plaque out of your arteries that have been hurt by people who lied to you. He knows how to massage the hard places to allow the muscle to regenerate. He knows how to speak to the vessels and the, and the corpuscles and the, and, the, and the aorta and the ventricles. He knows how to put it back together. Jesus knows how to speak to your heart so that you begin to have the strength that you need to walk this thing out. Jesus is not inside of you to hurt you. He's there to protect you. He wants to get in in order to break you out. Tell somebody it's an inside job. So here, I want to ask you. I want to challenge you. Anybody up for a challenge? For those who truly want to be a disciple, let me see your hands first. Here's your challenge. Write it down. Put it in your vision journal that I asked you to buy six weeks ago and you were disobedient. (laughs) Put this in your phone. For the next four months... September, October, November, December. Each month, you're going to read one gospel. September, Matthew. October, Mark. November, Luke. And December, John. And we're going to read a gospel a month. Along with your other readings, you're going to read the wisdom literature, you're going to read some Old Testament. But we're going to read these gospels so we can get to know Jesus more. It's funny because the purpose of the vision series is to let you know what we're about. If you don't like this kind of stuff, go over there where they're going to tell you you're going to get 16 houses and 45 cars and everything's going to work out and nothing changes. We could come over here and realize that discipleship is a long walk. It is a journey. And the purpose is not to get comfortable. It's so us to look like Christ. And and it's not about what I get. It's about what I can give, which is I can speak to devils and they have to leave. I can speak to cancer and it has to shrivel up. I can speak to dead things and they rise up. I can speak to men of God in wheelchairs and they're going to get up two and a half months from right now fully absolutely totally healed but it's going to start tonight in the bottom of his feet and it's going to begin to regenerate his cell his cells do you hear what I'm saying I'm prophesying because I want to be a disciple so here's here's what I want to ask you what if I could give you dedicated focused videos to help you engage so you can learn about Jesus would you take those What if we gave you dedicated, focused uh, scripture references so you can learn and study those? Would you take them? All right. So if I give you the tools by September 1st, who's going to go on the gospel challenge with me? Once a month, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, September, October, November. One woman stood. I was checking. Okay. I I, want to see you stand. Who's going to go on the challenge? Pastor Darius? Who's in? We in, man? Elder, we in? Who's in? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. We're going to give them videos, dedicated scripture. We're going to walk this thing out. Because I want to look more like Jesus. See, because 2018 has to do two things. I got to get rooted and I got to get, I got to get the weeds out. You need to know that 2018 was designed to get rid of everybody and everything that is not supposed to go into your destiny Lewis people don't realize that 2018 was designed to put you in the strategic places that you're supposed to be because this is the year where the things you've sown in the years past are coming to meet you in the final quarter of the year some of y'all don't realize that the tears that you've sown Because here's the thing, when you're planted, it cannot grow without water and fertilizer. And some of us have been like, God, my life stinks. God, it stinks around here. God says, that's the fertilizer. You don't realize that the stink is a sign that something's about to break through the ground. It had to stink because it kept the wrong ones away. Only the ones that can handle the stink deserve to handle the fruit.
your tears watered the ground. Anybody like me ever cried some tears this year? Listen to me. Before this year is over, we're going to look like, sound like, act, walk, act like, walk like, and cast demons out like Jesus. And as we do this each day, each week, each month, we're going to have investigation, inspection, and investment of time. We're going to investigate the word. We're going to inspect our fruit. We're going to, we're going to invest in people. And we're going to invest in our relationship with Jesus Christ. So here's the question, can you belong before you believe? The answer is yes. If you're in here and you're not a Christian or a Christ follower or you are an individual of another faith, we, we honor and look forward to walking with you through the Gospels because there are people who are genuinely seeking truth, not religion. And if truth is what you seek, walk with us through the last quarter of the year and watch if Jesus does not reveal himself to you in a new way. Can I get an amen? I can belong before I believe. And I still believe even when I don't always behave. I say this and then we're going to have altar call and we're going to go home. You know a disciple based on their joy. Weird joy, just smiling for no reason. Always greeting everyone, praise the Lord. Really, is that all? Yes, he is worthy. I want you to keep your joy. I want to put a big cheesy grin on your face because your life just changed. September 1st is when, Saturday? Saturday? Hear me. This week marks the seismic shift because the fourth quarter, harvest is coming. Listen to me. I'm not playing church games. People in this room right now are going to be gifted with a level of financial resource that will not make sense. And you will have to sow because of how much you receive. strategies for your business, investments that you made are going to go through the roof, open doors, the business plans that you all put on the altar, we're bringing them out next week and we're going to announce our business incubator. For those who have businesses, we're going to have classes to help you get your credit where it needs to be so you can get loans. We're going to bring in banks who are willing to listen to your business ideas next week. Did you see y'all? All right. All right. Get your joy. This is the season where the people who sowed into you are going to see the fruit. All the prayers you prayed, all the things you prayed, mama, you're going to see it. One of my mentors is here. He snuck up on me. I didn't know he was here. Lewis Upkins is one of the great men of God. And when I was living in Nashville and I was a single man and trying to figure things out, or many times I was battling through identity issues and depression and not sure about what my future looked like, I would just go to his house and he and his wife would let me in and I'd sit at his kitchen table and I'd just listen because he was walking out a place of authority and leadership and fatherhood that was foreign to me. And I looked up this morning and he's sitting on the second row and I didn't know he was coming and it caught me off guard and I'm crying because I remember where I was sitting in his kitchen and leaving his home and wondering if God had a plan for my life and if so, what am I supposed to do? And I really feel like giving up, but God, if you can do what you're doing in Lewis's life and he's got this beautiful wife and these kids and they're serving you, then maybe you can do that in me. And so his love for his wife and kids, his passion for the kingdom gave me hope. And now he's sitting on the second row and you see fruit from what you sowed. So on behalf of me, my wife and my two kids, thank you for being an example to me when I had just about given up 
And now I'm here. And God won and the devil lost. So people might see me and credit me with the basket. You get credited with an assist. Love you, man. I want you to pray with me. I want you to pray with me. Lord Jesus, I pray that you will speak through your word and that you will do for your people what only you can do. And I pray in the name of Jesus that you will cause us to look more like Jesus, that we are disciples, not just casual church attendees. We love you and we give you honor. With heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're in here and you want to be a disciple of Jesus, a follower of Jesus Christ, and you need to give your life to Jesus for the first time, first time, salvation or you need to rededicate your life or you need in your heart you know you're called to be a part of relentless church you need to join this church you know i'm talking to you and i want you and all of your things to get here right now on the count of three i want you bring all your stuff and i want you your family your cousins the dog if you brought it and i want you to come down to the front of this church right now don't wait don't wait don't wait one two, three. Look at that. He came down by himself. Who is this? This is your boy? He's six. Where's his mama? He said he wanted to come down. What'd he say? He said, what'd he say? He walked down on his own. You didn't tell him to. He's six. And the Lord touched his heart. Because the Holy Ghost is age appropriate. The Holy Ghost knows how to talk to a six-year-old. What's your name, buddy? Isaiah. Isaiah, do you know Jesus loves you? Yes. You know, today, everything in your life got better. And I want to tell you, as your pastor, I'm proud of you. You're an amazing young man. It's clear that you are a leader. You're going to change the world. And I pray blessings and protection and favor on you. And I'm so proud of you. And I can't wait to watch God use you to change the world. Amen. Can you tell everybody Jesus is Lord? Jesus is glory. Somebody give God praise for the prophet Isaiah. I want y'all to pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, it's me. I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that Jesus is Lord. Thank you for the blood that was shed for me. I'm made right with the Father, not by my works, but by the finished work of Jesus Christ. I thank you. My life is brand new. You have my heart, all my gifts, and my future. You are my Savior and my Lord, and I'm gonna live forever with you. But while I'm on the earth, I'm going to walk with you, talk with you, and look like you, and function like you. In Jesus' name, amen. We believe if you prayed that prayer, you just got saved. Welcome, young Batson.